So this morning, we're going to start a new series called Love Race. All right? And I want to start with prayer, and I'm going to start with a question. Because again, I believe that this message will be powerful. I believe that, and not because it's Pastor Zane's words, because it's God's word. And because you're willing and, and able to accept God's word. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this word today, Lord, is your word. We thank you, Father, that as it goes forth, it will not return void. We thank you, Lord, that it goes swiftly, Father, because there are things that need to happen today, Lord. I thank you, Father, your word goes swiftly. And I thank you, Lord, that the hearers who hear it this morning, Lord, will honor that word. They will receive it with expectation. They will be willing, Lord, Father, to let you change them from the inside out. They will willing, be willing, Lord, to be your love to someone else. To be truth to someone else because of this word on the inside of them. And I thank you, Father, that we will not stay the same. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Say this to me. Say, I'm a doer. Say, I'm a doer. Say, I'm a doer of the word of God. All right. Let's get in this, guys. Love race. I'm going to start with a question. Think of the word love. Does anybody have a definition of the word love? And I'd like you to say it out so I can repeat it. Anybody have a word, a definition of the word love? God. God. Anybody else? Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13. Family. Anybody else? Love. Definition of love. Putting someone else's needs before yours. Can I get an amen? Amen. Friends. Unconditional. Compassion. Sacrificial. And just on Facebook and YouTube, this is all ages, all uh, colors that are saying these words. Agape. Mercy. Sacrifice. Grace. Peace. Forgiveness. Trust. Laying down your life. Faith. Prayer. Betty Cotton says, thank you, Betty Cotton. Unconditional. Amen. I am going to stop right there. Do you realize we could keep going all day long? And all week long? And all year long? Because love doesn't have, love doesn't have any bounds, guys. There's no height, there's no depth, there's no width to God's love. So let me ask you another question, definition. How do you define race? Someone said it? Unity? Someone said the 500? Anybody else? Huh? Running, running, mankind. mankind, any others, time, sure, racing for time, okay, cars, hard, oh, Audrey's t- thinking about running hard, racing is hard, <laughs> striving, Unstoppable. Praying for race. Okay. To win. So I'm going to go ahead and stop there. If you look up the word race in the dictionary, there's no mention of mankind. There's no mention of color. There's no mention of diversity. It's a competition. It says a competition between horses, cars, people. That's what race is. And I looked multiple places for the definition. I'm looking all over, and I did not find anywhere in in Webster's Dictionary, um, online dictionary. It was all about competition. Yeah, wanting to be a winner. And And so if you look up the origin of race, as unfortunately we see it right now in our nation, 
in terms of the division of blacks, whites, uh, Latinos, um, Chinese, however you want to break it down, yellow, red. That actually origin came from medieval England, medieval times, 1500s is if you look at that origin. I'm not going to say the exact one, but that's where they think it came from, is when they started breaking up how people um, saw each other, okay? And so you have that where that then morphed into what it is today over those centuries to where we have this divide. And if you know where Satan stands on divides, on division, you know that this is a spiritual thing, right? And so what we're going to talk about today is love race in the sense that we're in a love race. Not just loving races, but we're in a love race. And I'm going to prove it to you in the scriptures. No matter what your color, no matter what your background, no matter where you came from, we're in a love race. Amen? And it is a competition. But here's the thing, it's not a competition against each other. It's a competition against the devil trying to keep something away from us that God intended us for, to have before the city of Babylon, before the Tower of Babel, where division happened. And division happened before then, but specifically division happened at that place where everybody was put all over the place with different languages. Okay? God intends for us to be in unity. Yesterday at the prayer meeting, someone, and I believe this was from God, they said, not uniformity... I say it right? The body of Christ is to be in unity, not uniformity. Amen? We're to be together. Not everybody my way, not everybody your way, but together. Okay? And that's why we should not be colorblind. We should see color. We should love each other, no matter what color they are. Amen? All right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians... Go to 2 Corinthians 5. As you're going there, I'm going to give you a couple other, I'm going to give you one other definition. The definition of racism. The definition of racism is prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. That's racism. It doesn't say black versus white. It talks about, so it, this racism could be, um, it could be Americans at one time uh, were very racist towards Italians and Jews and still are, unfortunately, in some areas. Amen? So don't ever think that it's just black and white. It's not. Racism is way bigger than that. But let's also face the elephant in the room that it is, unfortunately, black and white. Can I get an Amen. Okay. Now, and, and part of this, and so you know where this comes from, of why we're talking about this. Number one, it needs to be talked about. Number two, I believe God wants us to talk about it. And number three, talking with people in our church, they want to talk about it. Amen? And so we're going to be doing this for more than just today. We're going to be doing this over the next few weeks, maybe even a couple months, maybe longer. I don't, wherever, however long God wants us to go. We're going to be dialoguing with members of our church. All right? I already have people that are, that are willing to, to do that, which is pretty neat because these are some very sensitive, hard stuff that we're going to face. But does God give us the grace to do it? Will it make us better? Amen? Yes. When you face stuff, when you stir stuff up, yesterday we were in our prayer meeting and I kept hearing the words, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Well, sometimes when you stir it up, you get some stuff from the bottom that will come up. And you'll be like, ugh, that doesn't look good. But you got to address it. You pull it out. You, you don't just leave it and say, well, it'll go away. No, it stays there. Amen? And so we need to fix it. Because Have you ever burnt macaroni and cheese before? Yeah. Or burnt um, baked beans there at the bottom? And as long as you let it sit, you don't taste it. But when you stir it up and you grab the hold of that stuff, it gets to the top, you got to deal with it. Amen? And that's what we're doing today. We've got to deal with it. 
All right? Amen. Did you get there to 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 to 17. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. This is the race you're in. That is your race right there. Verse 10. Look at somebody say, that's my race. Okay? I'm going to read it again. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. See, that's the thing. The race you're in, I'm not racing against... Ty, I'm not racing against Pastor Rachel. I'm not racing against John. I'm not racing against Susan, Susie, um, Miss Sue. Sorry, I just gave you all those pet names, Miss Sue. Amen. But it's me I'm racing against. Me and all those things that I'm supposed to do. That's my race. Am I doing what I'm supposed to do the right way? And I'm going to be, I'm going to be at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know if he's going to have like a scroll. And I don't know if we're going to sit down in chairs. I, 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 I don't know if we'll just be floating and God will just be talking to me. I don't know what that'll look like. I just know it's going to happen. Look at somebody say, it's going to happen. Okay, let's go to verse 11. Oh, let, and let me, can I throw out a definition real quick? In the Greek, that word appear means breaking everything away. It, it means naked. It means that it's obvious. Like, I mean, you are, you're not going to be behind behind anything. You are exposed. You won't be able to hide behind anything when you come before the judgment seat of Christ. It's all going to be there. Okay? Your good looks aren't going to fool anybody anymore. All right? Okay, verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we have a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels, or excuse me, controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, all things new, or new things have come. Amen. And so let's go through some of this. Again, first 10 there, we showed you what the race is. Okay? In the, um, in the New Living Translation, it says, verse 11, says, Because we understand our fearful responsibility to God, we work hard to persuade others. God knows we are sincere, and I hope you know this too. That's one of the things that when you do your love race, when you do your love walk toward others, your prayer is that others see God's love in you. Amen? You need to pray that. And I believe it's um, either 1 Thessalonians or 2 Thessalonians 3.12 that the love of God is manifested in you. Okay? And you need to let, you need to, you need to do that. You need to show God's love to people. They need to be able to see God's love in you. God's love outward also from you. Okay? And then in verse 12, this is the New Living, are we commending ourselves to you again? No, we are giving you reason to be proud of us. So you can answer those who brag about having a spectacular ministry rather than having a sincere heart. So here's the, here's the earthly competition that happens. Even in churches, we try to outdo the other church. Okay, guess what? That's not our competition. Is this helping? That's not our competition, guys. Okay? We're not fighting against one another. We are being led of the Lord, and then we do what we're called to do. That's why last week when I said, all right, um, I know we're supposed to give to a food pantry. I was not concerned about which one. I'm so excited it's the one at Spirit of Life Church. So we, but, because I'm not, I just want people to be helped. I want people to be loved. Amen? Because I'm not competing against them. I'm competing against flesh. I'm competing against... 
um, against what God has for me to do, whether I'm going to do it or not. That's my competition. Okay? And if you know Pastor Zane, I do like to compete. I like to race. I like to play games. All right? But this is, this is eternal life we're talking about. Not life and death. This is eternal life. Okay? What I do here affects the rest of my eternity. What you do here. Point yourself. Say, what I do here affects my eternity. Okay? But yet Paul says, we're telling you these just so you know we're doing stuff. And that's why we share stuff with people, to let you know what we are doing here at the church. Not to brag, but just to let you know, hey, we're not in competition with everybody, but we are doing what God's called us to do. Amen? And so you can say, you know what, I go to a great church that's not afraid to talk about stuff right now. I, do, I go to a great church that sees needs in the community and bonds together to meet those needs. Amen? And if you're like, where is that great church? I know a great one on the west side of Indianapolis. This one. Amen? And there are other great churches, but I'm not in competition with them. We can help each other. And I do believe during this time we are to come together as the body of Christ, as churches. Because we're not in competition with each other. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep going. Verse 14. Excuse me, verse 13. This is the new living. If it seems we are crazy, it is to bring glory to God. And if we are in our right minds, it is for your benefit. Isn't that interesting how Paul says, hey, we're going to do some love stuff that may look kind of crazy. And the reason we're doing it is because God told us to do it. But then we'll rein it in so that you know we're not crazy. Right? No, I mean, that's the thing is... That's where, and I think this is so cool, the different things that have happened over the few, the last probably 10 years, where you, um, now you may be in line uh, at a Starbucks and someone will pay for your order. Has anybody had that happen to them before? Yeah, well, they'll pay it forward, okay? And people are like, oh, that's a new idea. No, it's not. That is, <laughs> that's an ancient idea that God created, all right? And it cul culminated with Jesus, he said, I'll pay it forward. I'll pay it forward and cover all your debts. Amen? Amen, everybody. Okay? But that's a love act. And that's the thing. We need to be willing to do love acts that are maybe out of the ordinary. That's why we started doing our gas buy-down a few years ago. That's why we do the things we do as a church. That's why I hope you are led of the Lord at times, that if God says to bless somebody, bless somebody. You could be blessing them with your time, with your money, with your, with your, your love, your smile, whatever. God doesn't put a, a box on how he wants you to love, but he wants you to be led of him, and he wants you to do it in sincerity, and he wants you to do it without expecting something in return. Amen? I mean, love's pretty simple. It really is. It's pretty simple. Praise God. All right, let's go to verse 14. And verse 14 is the culminating verse of this. Because the love of God should compel, constrain, or control you. And we'll talk about what that means. So look here. It says in verse 14, in, um, in the, yeah, I'll read it from the, New Living, or from the New Living Translation. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, and we also believe that we have all died to our old life. Okay? Christ's love should be controlling us. Not our traditions, not our past, not our hurts and pains. Amen? But Christ's love, Christ's love needs to be controlling us during this time. And that word controls, if you look it up, so in, there's, in different translations, whichever one you look, You'll get controls, you'll get compels, you'll get constraints. And what it means is, it is a narrowing. Okay? And so what you're doing, when you are constrained, you are being pushed. You are being changed. You are being chiseled. You are being, you are being cut away to where I'm looking at the form that God wants me to be. Isn't that good? 
So a lot of times we think that the love of God like forces you to go this way and that way. No, the love of God changes you. So then you are empowered to do what God's called you to do. God does not force you to do anything. Isn't that good? So the love of God doesn't force you to do anything. The love of God changes you and empowers you to do what you need to do for God. Come on. Praise the Lord. Yes. I think there's a lot of thinking happening. And let it process. But God does. God changes you to where you can be empowered by Him. He is, it, love isn't, you're going to love people. I'm going to make you. That's not love. That's not free will. That is force. That is dictatorship. God's not a dictator. He's a gentleman. We've heard the Holy Spirit called a gentleman. Amen? But think about that. Love changes you, so you are empowered to do what God's called you to do. That's what constrains, controls, compels means. So then, yes, I'm controlled by God when I'm led by the Spirit of God, but I'm not forced. Because sons and daughters, what does it say in Romans 8, 14? That if you are, um, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And we know that someone said it, that love is God. I said, what's love? They said, God. Love is God. And the Holy Spirit is God. So then the Holy Spirit leads me. Love leads me. Amen? But I need to be willing to be constrained, to be me changed. Say me. Say it like a caveman. Me. Me changed. Yes. We need to get out of caveman mentality. Me. Me changed. And we need to be changed. I'm going to show you a quick analogy. I need, because she's on the front row, Audrey, come here. Stay there for a minute. Audrey, come up here. So we're going to do an analogy about what it means to be constrained. All right. Have you guys heard of a monkey trap before? Okay, you heard of a monkey trap, right? And if you haven't, I'll explain it. So uh, one way that they, um, they catch monkeys in the jungle is they trap them by, and, they, I, I, and I saw where they use coconuts. They'll use coconuts, and they'll put a little hole that just their hand can fit in, and they'll put something on the inside that's bigger than the hole. Well, that monkey sticks its hand in the hole, all right, and then grabs a hold of something in there. Now grab it. And then tries to get it out. Okay, no. And they can't get it out unless they let it go. And so what happens is they don't let it go because they're greedy. Monkeys are greedy. Don't just leave it there. Don't pull it. Don't, don't prove me wrong. Just leave it there. Okay? And so what happens is, so hold on to something. Which one are you going to hold on of? She's holding on to greed, all right, and hold it so it can face that way. So she's holding on to that. Well, what happens is, is you get a hold of that and you don't let it go because you're selfish, because you don't think you need to. And some people say, well, I'm not greedy. All right? But who knows your heart? God does. And here's the thing. A lot of times there can be greed in a situation and we're not willing to admit it or we can't see it. And the only thing that can help us see it or show us is something that is bigger than this. Justice, come up here. Do you know what it is that's bigger than greed? Let greed go and pick up that next one. What's that other one in there? Racism. Okay. The only thing that can change it is if love comes. If love comes, and here's what happens, and here's why I said constrained. See, this hole here, this is a box that represents flesh, that represents the spirit of darkness. You are stuck in a box when you hold on to these things. When you hold on to greed, when you hold on to sin, when you hold on to racism. And I don't want to, I talked with someone yesterday. He said one of the things that's, that's, that's an issue during this talk is everybody lumps in racism as just sin. Racism has a name. Amen? It's cancer, cancer is a sickness, right? But we call it cancer. Amen? And we fight it as cancer. Same thing with racism. Racism is a name. And it says that there is a name above all names. And what name is that? 
Jesus. Okay? Well, here we have love. And so love comes in. And here's someone who is, and, and Audrey usually isn't like this, I promise. She's just, this, is a, this is just um, a, a little drama. It's just an example. Okay? But Audrey's holding on to racism and won't let it go. Well, here she looks. Look at justice. She sees love. Love is the only thing, God's love is the only thing that's going to help her to let that go. Let that go. Let that go. Let it go. Okay? Now, she's going to come over here, and she's going to see love. And now she's going to grab a hold of love. Okay. Well, don't take it from him. Yeah. Share it together. There's plenty of love to go around. Amen? You don't have to take it from anybody. There's plenty to go around. And here's the thing. It does not matter what you look like. Okay? And here's the thing about love, and I did this on purpose. When you get into racism and greed and sins, you get in a box and you don't get out of it. When I have love, look at all the space I have. I can do all that God wants me to do. You stay there and that's all, you're stuck. And it's time for us to get unstuck. It's time for us to use love. It's time for us to share, just like Justice did. Justice could have kept this all to himself and said no. And then she would have been stuck in racism. She would have been stuck in greed. But he said, and also because I told him to. But, but no, he came up here and he says, here, have God's love. Amen. Isn't that good? Okay, you guys are awesome. Take these for me. Okay, go ahead and walk off. Yeah, you can keep that. Keep that box, Audrey. Amen, amen. Amen. But did you see what had to happen? She had to get narrow to get that out. And you, can't, you cannot be ne as narrow as God needs you to be when you hold on to those things. Okay? Now, one of the things that I shared on Facebook Live is kind of a, a little, or um, online, no, on the, on the phone message yesterday, was that there is actually an example of where Jesus had to deal with racism. So go to Luke chapter 9. And this will be on the screen as well. And while you're going there, I'm going to give you another example. So Luke chapter 9, verses 51 to 56. Also in um, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Right after Jesus was born. And some of you guys know where I'm going with this. Immediately, King Herod tried to have Jesus killed. And so therefore, there was a genocide over any baby in Bethlehem that was under the age of two. That is racism. Amen? And so Jesus, I mean, so, um, so basically Jesus' family, Mary and Joseph, left and went to Egypt. Because if not, their son could have been killed. Jesus could have been killed because there was genocide. There was racism. All right? Now, Jesus dealt with it as an adult as well. So let's look at this. Let's look at Luke 9, 51 to 56. And I've read this story many, many times. And, and I mean, just when, you, when you're facing stuff, when you see things that are happening, you look at things from a different perspective. And I believe, and I believe it's from the Spirit of God. And I haven't said these guys' names yet, but Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd. Unfortunately, these are guys where this happened for real. Where there were, there were things that done, where both those lives, they could both still be here on earth, but they're not. And some may say, well, no, how do you know they're, they're ha guys? Let's just face it. There were racial issues there. All right? Not everybody responds the same way to a white person as they do a black person, unfortunately, in some settings. And so let's just face it. Let's just be honest about it. Let's stop trying to make excuses on both ends, and let's just face it. Amen? And so let's look how Jesus faced it. Watch this. In Luke 9, verse 51, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead of him, and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. But they did not receive him. I'm going to say that again. But they did not receive him. 
because he was heading to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do, what, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Guys, do you see that? Do you see what just happened there? Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. At this time, um, Jews and Samaritans, they were not on the, I mean, it was literally like the 60s, okay? Where the, it was black and white to them. It was Samaritan and Jew. You're a Jew, I, if I'm a Samaritan and you're a Jew, we do not get along. Okay? And, there, and obviously, Jesus shows examples here where they did because he got along with them. And that's what happened in the 60s and the 70s and different things. And even today, unfortunately. But Jesus shows here that he got racially profiled. You're a Jew, you're going to Jerusalem? Nope, you can't stay here. And so therefore, he had to go on. So you see that, that can you agree with me that that's racism? That's a prejudice that's being shown. Just because he was a Jew was the only reason. It wasn't because he, he, was, he was one of the best teachers at the time. All right? And they're like, no, we don't care how good of a teacher you are. Get out of here. Now, look at those around him. And I'm laughing because of just how quick it turns. James and John said, hey, you want us to call fire down on them? Because this is after... This is after they'd already been, the, the disciples had gone out and had cast out demons. This is after they'd gone out and they would saw healings take place. So they had the power of God on them. All right, so they're, they're like, all right, Jesus, we'll take them out. And look what Jesus says. He rebukes them. He says, no. Now, why did he say no? He, he tells it in the next verse. He gives the exact reason why it's a no. Okay? Because he could have. He could have said, you know what? Take them out, guys. They're not worth it. They don't want to accept us as who we are. We'll take care of them. We got the power of God. But he didn't say that. He rebuked them and he said, you do not know the spirit you are of. You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. That's what he said. Okay? And we know that this is a spiritual battle. Amen? We don't fight against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the principalities, the power of darkness. We're fighting against the, the devil. We're fighting against Satan. That's what this, that's what the, if you get down to the root of this, that's why it's strife and division. There's a book that Kenneth Copeland wrote about four years ago about racism in the church. Okay? And it's really, and it's about strife and division and other stuff, but that's a big part of it, okay? And that's what the Lord, that's what, and that's what Jesus saw in this situation. He knew that what the devil was trying to do with that is divide them between Jews and Samaritans, and then have them retaliate against the Samaritans, and so then it just keeps going on and on for years and years. But Jesus said, nope, he rebuked them, told them it's a different spirit that they're not of, and then they left. Amen? Now, that is a simple way to deal with racism. Here's the thing. Not everybody can do a situation like that. I know someone in our church that they were driving in a certain area. And because they were black, they did either did not get served or got served in a wrong way, inappropriately. I mean, just bad, bad. And here in Indiana, I won't narrow it down, but here in Indiana. And they were able just to leave. And they didn't go back. But say this with me. Say, it happens. If it happened to Jesus, it could happen to anybody. Can I get an amen? Right? Now, Jesus gave us an example of what to do. Now, not every situation is like that. You can't always get away from it, unfortunately. Okay, racism may be in, maybe at your job. I mean, there may be things you're dealing with that you can't get away from it just like immediately like that. Okay? 
And I'm not going to talk about every single one of the situations today. Now, maybe over the, the next few weeks as we're talking, maybe something will come out. But I want you, what I want you to see in this is, one, there's a spirit behind racism. And it's always a spirit of division. Amen? Okay? But let's get back. To, and, and this is how Jesus did it, too. Jesus was full of God's love, right? He, is the, he had the spirit without measure. Say this to me. Say the spirit without measure. So therefore, he had the love of God without measure. That height, width, depth, we won't ever grasp all of God's love. But Jesus did. Jesus could grasp all of God's love. Right? Because he's, he's the Lord. Jesus is Lord. So he can grasp all of God's love. We can't. We, but, so there's no height, no depth. But we can still get more. Say, I want more. Okay? And walking more in God's love. So God needs to increase so that I can decrease. Remember we talked about being constrained to God's love? And I know that sounds backwards. That okay, God's going to give me more of his love, but then I'm going to get smaller. You're going to get smaller to the things of God is what you're going to do. Amen? So if you look in John 3, verse 30, and you can go there or not, it says, he who come, or excuse me, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that's why it fulfills that analogy we use. That if I let God increase in my life, the love of God, then I can narrow out and get away from that stuff. I can get away from racism. Amen? We want racism to die, but I want racism to die in each of us. Unfortunately, racism will always be here. But I can kill it in me. You can kill it in you. Amen? I can say, I, we can kill it in our church. We can kill it in our city because we have authority. Say, I have authority. Amen? Yeah, no, let's, let's do this. Let's talk about it. Let's address it. Let's get it. Let's stop pushing it aside and saying, oh, another, another person gets shot, so it's going to create riots. No, wrong attitude. And we'll be talking about this over the weeks. But let's just face an example. Our black brothers and sisters in Christ have different conversations with their kids when it comes how to deal with police officers. I've never had to talk to Josiah about how, how if you don't respond a certain way, you may lose your life. But many black families do. Right? And if you didn't know that, talk to some black people in our church. And this isn't about being um, martyrs. This isn't about being... Uh, nobody wants a pity party. We just need to listen to each other. Amen? Open up. Be honest. Okay? I can't get in someone else's skin. They can't get in my skin. But I can hear you. I can listen to you. Amen? Now, I have talked to Josiah of how he responds to a police officer that you pull over the side of the road. And this is for everybody. You pull over as far as you can on the side of the road. You make sure if it's at night, you have a light on on the inside. You make sure the car's turned off. You make sure you show respect, all those things. But I have never had to say, you may lose your life if you don't respond a certain way. It just never entered my mind because I've never experienced or never had to deal with it. All right? Now, here's how we let God's love increase in our life. Okay? Because I'm not going to end on a Debbie Downer because that's not God. God has an answer for this. Amen? Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. We're going to end with this this morning. There's been three passages that I've been meditating on a lot lately. Whenever I do messages and sermons, I always find passages that I meditate over and over and over. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Romans 8, 35, 37 to 39. And Psalms 136 have been the three that I've just been hitting over and over and over and over. Because I want more of the love of God. 
That's what it's going to change this, but I need to get it inside of me. So if you look in Romans chapter 8, verse 35... It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Guys, our country is in some tribulation. Our country is in some stress. Our country is going through some stuff. Let's be honest. Each of us are in some of that. Even last week when I was given the, addressing our congregation, knew it needed to happen, knew I needed to talk to everybody. Someone said, Pastor, you looked a little, maybe a little nervous. I just know the, I know what this means to everybody. And even I'm hurt. We should all be hurt. If you're not hurt or if you're not thinking about stuff right now, you need to check yourself. Amen? And I'm not saying you need to be in worry because we don't worry. I'm not saying you need to be um, flustered to the point to where you can't live. It's not that. But there should be something tinging on your heart. Okay? But look here. Go to verse 37. It says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Look at that. Say, I am more than a conqueror. But why are you? Because it's through him who loves you. It's God's love in you that you can be more than a conqueror. Nothing that you, God's love in you. Him constraining you, controlling you, compelling you. Him leading you, guiding you, Him changing you so that you can be empowered to do what He needs you to do. Amen? And then 38 says, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Now, look at this. There's nothing that can separate you from God. Watch this, church. And as the church, there's nothing that can separate us. Even racism can't separate our church. Isn't that good? When you are, and even, and we, and we preach this for marriages, your marriage. When you're both in the love of God, there's nothing that can separate you. Amen? Amen? One of the things that, that um, Rachel's dad had said, uh, Rachel's dad, Billy Williams, charter class of Rama, just faith guy, faith guy, faith guy, faith guy, okay, at a wedding. And he told Rachel and I this many times, but at his niece's wedding, he got up and said, what you need to do is you need to out-love one another. Your goal is to out-love. Now, again, remember I said we're not in a competition, okay? But your goal is to, how can I love this person? How can I love these people? How can I love each other? How can we love each other? Because we are in a love race. And in the love race, color doesn't matter. In a love race, where you come from doesn't matter. I don't care if you came from America. I don't care if you came from Chicago. I don't care if you came from Connecticut. I don't care if you came from Maine. I don't care where you came from. It doesn't matter. Because the love of God can't separate me from loving you or excuse me, the love of God, nothing can separate me from loving you. The love of God helps me to wear nothing else. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror over racism. I'm more than a conqueror over greed. I'm more than a conqueror over lust. I'm more than a conqueror. Amen? You are more than a conqueror. Say that with me. Say, I'm more than a conqueror. Say, our church. Say this with me. Say, our church is led of the Spirit of God. Say, our church will love God and love each other. See, I don't even get to that part today about loving your neighbor and who's your neighbor. And that will be one of the things. Because again, that's a Jew and Samaritan. If you look at um, the, the Good Samaritan story. I mean, God gives us story after story and word after word about how to deal with this right now. But isn't that always the case with everything? God always, have a word. God always has a word. And yesterday at the prayer meeting when I was, when I was talking to um, the pastor of the church that we were at, awesome guy, um, it's called The Refuge in Rockport, Indiana, really cool place. And uh, he's actually been here at one of our prayer meetings. But uh, talking to him, he said, you know, whenever the king, the priest, and the prophet were in line, 
Israel never lost a battle. Never lost a battle. When the prophet, priest, and king were in line, they never lost a battle. Amen? So think about that today. Guys, as we get the prophets and the pastors and the, the fivefold ministry, as we get the priests, your priests, amen? As we get the, the, our, our, uh, our government, we can get in line, amen? And that takes some, that's takes some, I mean, we need to talk, we need to love, we need to grow. And we let God do that in our lives, amen? And we need to face stuff, we need to hit it head on. We're going to be continuing this next week, all right? And I challenge you, if you're able to be here, if you're able to be here, be here. Because the anointing is strong, and the anointing is going to help us. And let's face some stuff. And you don't need to be apologetic for who you are, by the way. When I was talking to a member of our church last night, that's one thing they were saying. They're like, no, you don't need to get, you don't need to get over, you know, you need to be you need to know who you are in Christ, no matter what col color you are. God made you that person, okay? If there are things you need to check in your spirit, in your soul, man, do it, all right? But make sure, don't, don't get in guilt, don't get in shame. God doesn't want you to be shamed, okay? You will never, ever hear us say shame on you, because that's not God. God is not a God of shame. So if you ever start feeling condemnation or shame, that's not God, that's the devil, but if you start feeling a conviction, if you start feeling an unction that, hey, I need to check an area, then make sure you do that. Amen? Let's stand this morning. Praise the Lord. I want to pray for everybody here. And I want you to take this time to let the love of God come in you. And this is why, oh, this is why being born again where you have the godlike nature on the inside of you is so that I mean obviously as a Christian you need that but if you really want to see racism change we need born again believers because it's born again believers that have the love of God on the inside of them amen and so we always start with that making sure that we're born again the way you get born again is you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord say this with me say Jesus is my Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him, that God, that Jesus died on a cross and was raised from the dead. So with your hand on your heart, say, I believe. Jesus died on a cross and was raised from the dead. So my sins could be forgiven and I could have a heart of love. Amen. When you pray and believe that, we believe that you're born again. When you get born again, we believe that God also has a gift for you. Does anybody want that gift? That gift is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so when you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then it's the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then as you are a born-again believer, and as you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you have the power of God. You have the wisdom of God. You have the, the sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to do and be empowered to do what God wants you to do. Amen? And I've even been dealing with this lately when I've been thinking... I don't know if you can hold on to racism and go to heaven. I don't know. I know God forgives sins. I know he does. But we'll talk about that about homosexuality. You can't be a homosexual and go to heaven. I don't think you can be a racist and go to heaven. I'll say, I mean, that's between you and God. But I'm telling you, this is something you need to get rid of out of your heart, out of your life. Amen? You rebuke it. You say, I don't want it anymore. Amen? And being born again, being filled with the Spirit... Awesome start, praise God. Amen. So I'm going to pray for each of you today. Let's lift our hands this morning. Bow your heads. Father, I thank you for every person here this morning. I thank you for this word that we heard. I thank you, Father, for the burdens that have been removed and the yokes that have been broken, Father, because the anointing of God through your word. I thank you, Lord, for us being set free as individuals and this church being set free. I thank you, Father, for this city being set free. For this nation being set free. I thank you, Father, for us not being afraid to confront this. I thank you, Lord, for you giving us the grace during this time. You have every answer we need, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that we receive that. I thank you, Lord, that this morning we've been changed. We've been chiseled. We've been con constrained, Father, to be able to be used by you, Father. 
to where we are empowered to do what you need us to do in love. I thank you, Lord, for giving us wisdom in every situation that we come across. I thank you, Lord, that we always walk in love, that we're not ashamed of your gospel, and that we apply your word immediately, directly. And I thank you for it. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over every person here this morning. I thank you, Lord, that they, Father, that they know the power of the blood and that they would know that the blood covers them, Father. The blood covers them, Lord. I believe you, Lord, that no coronavirus can come on this church, can come on our preschool, can come on anyone that's listening to this, Father, that they receive it, that they are protected by the blood of the Lamb. And I thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for prosperity, I thank you, Lord, for blessing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, we're not finished yet. We're going to do two more things. I'm going to have Ann and Miss Tracy come up here. And we're going to sing a blood song before we leave this morning. Amen. And then after we, we, we sing that, I'll come up and... Uh, actually, I'll just let Ricky come up here after that and dismiss us. Amen. So when they're done. And they, yeah, let's do it two times through, ladies. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. I tell you what, that might be ending our service, but I'm ready to start a whole new service. Two more hours. Everybody just stay over after that. Amen. Praise God. 
Well, thank you everyone for attending Spirit of Life Church, everyone for watching from home, on YouTube, Facebook Live. I tell you what, as Pastor Zane said, if you're able to be here, be here, because the anointing is very, very strong in this place. Amen? And so as we leave this place, let's continue to love one another. Let's continue to talk to each other, not at each other. And let's continue to listen as we continue to have conversations uh, with each other. Amen? Amen? Amen. So here at Spirit of Life Church, all right, something uh, very powerful that happens here. We teach victorious living through faith. Amen? And we do it by applying three very simple but very powerful principles. And so please uh, repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. And his word is absolute. And his word was sent to change my life as a believer. Amen and amen. You are blessed and dismissed. Do not forget your children and do not forget your car keys. Praise God. Amen. Everyone, we'll see you next week. Praise God.